Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first speaker, former congressman from Rhode Island and founder of the Kennedy Forum, Patrick Kennedy. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's an honor for me to have a chance to speak to all of you. I, uh, I'm, my name is Patrick Kennedy, and um, I'm the uh, author of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. And uh, that's the law that says that the brain is part of the body, and we ought to uh, reimburse it the same way as we do all other organs of the body. So I had the... Uh, Uh, I came from uh, Rhode Island, and I was the uh, youngest member of Congress when I was first elected at 27. And uh, when I got to Washington, Newt Gingrich had taken over control of the House, so I was in the minority party. And uh, Washington, D.C. works on the seniority system, so if you want to sponsor anything really popular, you, know, you have to be around a long time before you get to put your name first on any piece of popular legislation. Um, hence, my late father, Senator Edward Kennedy, was the sponsor of a lot of important pieces of social legislation, but he was also in the United States Senate for 50 years, practically. Um, so most of the people who sponsored popular bills were either had gray hair or no hair at all. And um, so when I got to Washington, I had uh, had this interest in mental health uh, equity. I had co-sponsored a bill called Parity in Rhode Island, and I thought I would sponsor it on the federal level. So when I went to the clerk to ask you know, where I could sign on, I was expecting out of 435 members of Congress, I'd be lucky if I made in the first 200 or the top 100 co-sponsors. Um, much to my surprise, the clerk of the United States House of Representatives said, uh, uh, Patrick, if you want to be the sponsor of parity, it's all yours. So uh, you got me here kind of by default. And, and that's because no one else wanted the words mental health and addiction next to their name. Uh, and uh, it, it, it says a lot about the struggle for mental health and addiction equity that the youngest member of Congress from the smallest state in the country and in the minority party got to be the sponsor of this landmark piece of legislation. So I introduced the bill with my good friend uh, Jim Ramstead, a Republican from Minnesota, and of course it took Congress about another decade to debate the issue as to whether the brain was part of the body and whether we should uh, reimburse for it accordingly. Eventually, uh, we ultimately did pass the bill, but it wasn't because uh, people in this country who have uh, family members or people themselves who are consumers of mental health services um, got up and said, wouldn't it be good if we had uh, elimination of the discrimination against those with these illnesses? Uh, frankly, the way it got passed was in 2008, um, we had the bill passed in the House, it was called H.R. 1424, sitting in the Senate, and uh, we were approaching the end of the session, and if we didn't pass it by the time we went home, we would have to reintroduce it in the next session. So I was desperate to get it off the desk, as it's called, in the Senate. Uh, so I called my late father and said, can you help me get this bill passed? And he said, call Chris. And by that, he meant Chris Dodd who was his great pal. Well, no sooner did he say that than about a week later, uh, and I called Chris, and Chris said he was going to think about how he could be helpful. A week later, the markets crashed. You may remember this in 2008, and the banking collapse. And the Congress came up with a $800 billion price tag of a bill to bail out the very banks that got us in the mess in the first place. But that was what they said was going to be what it took to keep our country from going into another um, Great Depression. Some of you may recall they were talking about how our country was going to slide into another Great Depression. So uh, Chris 
Dodd called me back and he said, Patrick, I've got just the way to pass your Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. And I said, what's that? He said, I'm going to write the whole TARP bill, Toxic Asset Relief Program, into your bill, uh, Bill 1424. Is that okay? And I said, yes, it's fine. I'm happy with that. He said, the only problem is that means you're not only going to be the sponsor of the mental health parity law, you're also going to be the sponsor of the largest federal bailout of our banks in our nation's history. And uh, so, of course, the bill passed, and wouldn't you know that the bill passed to save our country from going into another financial Great Depression is the bill to cover depression. <laughs> so, of course, nobody knew that because everybody was talking about the financial bill and they neglected the fact that there was this underlying bill that required us to limit discrimination um, in co-pays, in premiums, in deductibles, in lower lifetime caps for coverage, and to do it whether you are inpatient in network or outpatient in network or inpatient out of network or outpatient out of network or you needed emergency room benefits or pharmacy benefits. The bill requires that insurance companies pay for and cover equal access for all mental illnesses and addictions in the same way as they would cover all medical and surgical care at the primary care level, secondary care level, and tertiary le care level. And of course, this is the first in our country where um, mental health has been on par, hence parity, with the rest of medical care. But as all of you know, it's been 10 years since that bill was signed into law and we're still struggling to see that it is enforced and implemented. Because for too long in our country, mental health was segregated from the rest of health care. And it was carved out, as all of you know. In other words, it wasn't part of what we consider whole care for someone with cancer or diabetes or cardiovascular disease, which of course today you can't treat any of those conditions if you don't also treat underlying depression, anxiety, possibility of addiction. So it's a whole new cultural phenomenon that frankly the house of medicine still is not ready for. And by the way, insurers are not complying with. And if any of you are interested in how your particular state uh, or any state is shaping up against the goal of health equity, you can go on our Kennedy Forum website where it's called ParityTrack.org. ParityTrack.org has a 50-state metrics of how each state is doing against implementing this law. And they have the Millman Report. All of you know about the Millman Company. They analyzed 46 million claims data and found that every state was uh, short of, uh, and every health insurance company of complying with the law. So when I left uh, Congress, uh, in, in 2011, uh, it was the year that uh, this country was uh, honoring my late uncle, President Kennedy, and the new frontier. And I asked my cousin Caroline first whether I could use uh, her father's presidential library uh, on the anniversary of his moonshot speech because I wanted us to galvanize a new paradigm for brain research given the fact all brain research is siloed by diagnoses. And so we launched One Mind for Research on the moonshot, 50th anniversary of the moonshot. And the reason we did that is because we believe that instead of going to outer space over the next decade, we need to go to inner space. And that we need to use the same systems analysis that we used in order to assemble all the science that went into us going to outer space. And by the way, it was that moonshot that created the supercomputer. 
and it's the supercomputer that is now allowing us to analyze all the disparate types of data so that we can get a more complete picture of neuroscience across diagnoses at the genome, phenome, metabolome, pro proteome, and, and on connectome. And of course, we need mass computing technology in order to do all of those things. So after we uh, launched that, I, I was, uh, had a group of neuroscientists in the audience, and I said, amongst us today are astronauts for this new race to inner space. And wouldn't you believe these neuroscientists loved being called astronauts? So they all signed up, and we've created uh, some very exciting longitudinal studies uh, in, co in collaboration with Europe and China and Australia and um, the, in India because we know the only way we're truly going to understand uh, the human brain is to get more data points and to allow us to get to that uh, better understanding of how to intervene and treat illnesses of the brain. So you know, then I moved on and found another 50th of President Kennedy's and that was the 50th of his uh, signing the Community Mental Health Act of 1963. So um, President Kennedy, just before he was killed, signed this Community Mental Health Act, and he signed it in order to get people out of the asylums of those days where they were housed in very inhumane conditions. And what happened was we created Medicaid right after that, and it was decided that people with intellectual disabilities were worthy of coverage but people with mental illnesses and addictions, well, it was their fault that they had mental illnesses and addictions. So they were not covered in the same way as people with developmental disabilities. So what we ended up doing over the last 50 years is re-institutionalizing uh, people with uh, mental illnesses and addictions into the new asylums. The new asylums today are prisons and jails. and. Uh, uh, it's a real moral crisis for our country that it's our criminal justice system in every one of your states, in every one of your cities, it's your jail that's the le single leading provider of mental health and addiction services. And that is an indictment on all of us as a nation that that is the current state of being. So we um, took that anniversary to galvanize the whole mental health community around the notion that people ought to be treated with health equity. And it matched the anniversary of his making his famous speech on civil rights, where he said, who amongst us would be willing to trade the color of their skin and be content with those who counsel patience and delay? In other words, um, today, we want to make sure that these issues are addressed and we don't want to have to wait any longer. And that means we are not going to tolerate the discrimination by insurance companies. We're not going to tolerate the double standard by physicians. We're not going to tolerate this separate and unequal treatment of those with these illnesses. Because it's, in a sense, a medical civil rights bill. And by that mean, meaning we do not want to have this separate and unequal where we have to go to the colored water fountain, i.e. the mental health system that isn't reimbursed the same, that isn't, isn't respected in the same way, and that is on the margins of our whole health care system. We want to be totally integrated with the rest of health care. So we have uh, really assembled an agenda because, frankly, the mental health and addiction community has never had a really organized agenda. And uh, I hope, for those of you who are interested, uh, the Kennedy Forum has five principles. First, payer accountability. Second is provider accountability. We need to demand that people providing mental health and addiction services use evidence-based practices. This seems obvious but it is rarely done. And so we have to do both together. If, if insurers are gonna pay for the care now in a way that they never paid for before, we better make sure that those dollars go to reimburse care that has an expectation that you are gonna get better outcomes 
and that it isn't some kind of black box that you don't really know whether you're getting better or you're not. And uh, the third is integration to the rest of healthcare. Fourth is technology, and I know this whole conference is about the ability to use technology and leverage it to help improve health overall. And nowhere can that be more influential than in mental health. First slide, American Telemedicine. American Telemedicine Association has just um, instituted an accreditation program that will bring some clarity and credibility to the whole area of tele mental health and telepsychiatry. I think there's probably a lot of people in this audience who believe in the many aspects of telemedicine, particularly because of the fact they give us the chance to reach to those people who wouldn't otherwise seek care. Now they can seek it with some anonymity and they can get care that they need. In, a, in addition, telemedicine can help reach to rural parts of the country that would never be able to get this kind of expertise outside of having telemedicine. And so we believe because 30% of overall mental health today already is telemedicine, we believe it's going to skyrocket in the years ahead. And so we're very excited that the Telemedicine Association has uh, accredited this organization called CHQI, which uh, we have partnered with the Kennedy Forum so that we can promote some transparency in how uh, people get accredited and get that gold uh, standard of approval. Um, next slide, let me see here. Um, so as you know, there's lots of different types of telemedicine. There's consumer uh, to provider. There's obviously provider to consumer and provider to provider. And there's lots of modalities in between. And so we need to do a better understanding of how and where all of those should be set up so that we can guarantee the best quality outcomes for mental health as possible. Finally, let me say the other area that Clear Health Quality Institute is embarking on is parity accreditation. So we have the parity law, but there's really no one really enforcing it. So we've come up with a private market solution and Clear Health Quality Institute is uh, now engaging insurance companies to help them manage whether they are compliant or not with federal law. And that means that they have to disclose their medical management practices and ensure that the criteria that they use to determine pre-authorization, concurrent review, retroactive review, and so forth, that all of those criteria need to be the same across medical, surgical, and behavioral health. And frankly, we know that most insurance companies are not doing that, and we have um, several examples of that, which I'll say for later after if you're interested in knowing what those are, but suffice it to say we need insurance companies to step up. And if we don't have an administration that's going to make this an issue where they enforce it through the administration, then we have to enforce it through a, um, a, a, a platform such as this. Um, I want to take my last moment to say that um, in ending the denial of insurance companies for mental health and addiction. Uh, that's never going to happen until we end the denial in our culture uh, that these are real illnesses and that they need to be treated equally. I believe in the future we need to have a checkup from the neck up. A checkup from the neck up. From cradle to grave. Our pediatricians need to do the checkup from the neck up in order to detect whether our children have an intellectual disability and catch that early because we know early intervention makes the world a difference for children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Our young people need a checkup from the neck up because they need to have a screening as to whether their vulnerability is such for psychotic disorders and schizophrenia. And we know today more than ever about the biomarkers for schizophrenia and we need to make sure we move quickly because if we intervene in schizophrenia, we permanently change the trajectory of that illness, thereby eliminating the whole pathology of that illness where people are disabled really for the rest of their lives 
in, in, in ways that we would never want for any one of our family members. And a lot of that is preventable if we have the political will to do it. And finally, we need a checkup from the neck up throughout our senior years because, of course, we all know uh, cognitive decline and Alzheimer's is, is facing so many who are growing older, but the fact is we know that the real uh, pathology of Alzheimer's begins 25 years before the symptoms. And we need to identify that because all the new drugs that the pharmaceutical industry is coming up with to address Alzheimer's are only effective if used early in stage one of the disease. And, and that is why it's so on every score, Prevention, prevention, prevention. We could make a huge impact on the mental health and addiction crisis and the Alzheimer's crisis in our country if we take this organ of ours, the brain, much more seriously in what we pay for and how we reimburse for care and the innovation that all of you can bring to help treat the brain because if we can better treat this organ, all of us are going to have a better quality of life. And isn't that something that I know this conference is looking to achieve? Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you. Thank you, Patrick.